Um, so let's introduce topic number two, which is IoT security. Um, now, for those of you out there who are probably wondering why I'm talking about securing Nest thermostats, this isn't it. Um, IoT is actually becoming a huge issue in the enterprise, both from consumer grade IoT devices that are being um, introduced because someone in the C-suite wants color changing light bulbs in their office to more focused IoT type devices such as a HVAC systems and things like that. And I promise you, I'm not going to talk about that HVAC sensor that hacked that thing that one time or that hacked a point of sale terminal, but we all know which story I'm talking about. Uh, the problem there, and this comes from some of my own personal experiences, those systems are effectively black boxes that nobody gets access to. They're on my network, they're doing stuff, and I don't have any control over them. I barely know they work. So how am I supposed to secure something if I don't know it exists? Uh, there are a lot of challenges around this. But one of the things that we came up with as a topic when we started introducing this uh, panel was the fact that just because you can't manage the system doesn't mean you can't control it. So I want to open up by asking, you know, has anybody deployed some interesting IoT devices on their network? And, uh, you know, could be a thermostat, could be a, a, a humidifier or some kind of uh, other crazy thing, or it could be a giant milling machine that just happens to have an Ethernet jack on it. At a previous Good. company, at a, at a you know, manufacturing company, we had that problem all the time where the shop floor, they're basically IoT devices and, and the, the creator of that device, they don't think about security. And it's just, you don't have to worry about it. Our stuff works. Well, I worry about it. I was about to say something similar, Evan. So right now I work for an OT startup um, and we write software for these giant manufacturing machines. Um, and security is a really big issue with them. Like you said, um, the manufacturers of the machines aren't thinking about security and the engineers on the floor, they just wanna be able to write code and control the machine without sitting in front of it. Um, it brings a lot of benefits, but when you're talking about giant machines, not only are they an entry point to your network, those giant machines are, they're dangerous um, and they can all be controlled remotely now. So it's a, it's a huge issue. And one of the best things to do really is to put your IoT devices on a separate network, then lock that network down both to your internal stuff as well as the internet. One of the big problems that I've seen with IoT devices is they don't respect the corporate DNS settings you've got. They're hard coded for Google or Apple or whoever for their DNS. So you block the Google DNS servers and those devices no longer work. So you have I've, to... I've, I've seen to that point, Mike, I've seen IoT devices where the manufacturer hard codes the IP address. I've run into That's that as well. Yeah, and, and, and you know it's tough to block them down because they put in all these features for the end user, for, you know, for the people working on the shop floor, it might be, well, we have a feature that allows us to get in to, to remote control them. So if you have any problems, we get in there. I have a huge problem with that. Yeah, then I can say from personal experience that we actually did have to deal with that particular problem with an HVAC system where the um, users that were wanting to get remote access to change the temperature settings on the internal systems to save money left the box outside the firewall because they didn't want to ask us to modify anything, but then plugged an internal network card connection into the network and then left 3389 open to the world. And needless to say, when we started tracing down an infection and some unintended side effects, we found this box, found that it was open to the internet. And the phone call that we had to deal with when I got on the phone, they were not happy to hear from me. Um, and I was not very nice to them, but I, I flat out said, you know, all you had to do was ask us and we would have helped. And they're like, well, nobody really likes to help us because it's all a big mess with security. So we just did it anyway. And that's kind of when I came unglued and said some very unprofessional things. But like, you know, how do we deal with these kinds of situations where IoT just says, you know what, we're going to do it our way and, and screw you guys. I have one uh, home automation system that is um, reading sensors and is able to turn on um, power sockets and stuff like this. And it can send emails, but there's not like a real email server in this. It's too small. It's like a tiny box. It's five volts powered. So what it's doing, it, it is connecting via HTTPS request to the vendor's um, domain and sending the email text 
as an HTTP POST request, and that one will be turned into an email that is sent to me, which I really don't like because um, my my um, door for my apartment, when it opens and closes, I always get an email so that I know it's open and it closed, but I don't want the vendor to know. So what I did is I intercepted the HTTPS request by via DNS, because I overrode the DNS, uh, pointing it to my own HTTPS server, reversed the protocol, and then sent my own email. So that's how I got that one. Jasper, I'm sure what you did is so easy that anyone can do it. I, I completely agree with you, it's scary. That's what I was gonna say. The normal person would not have any clue as to what you just described, Jasper. But good kudos to you, you know, that's pretty clever. You could start a startup with that. <laughs> Anyone wants a software, I can even give you the source code. It's not a problem. It's the same problem we have with SNM, like we have with SNMP for many years on network devices. DNS is more or less the only configurable item on a lot of IoT devices. Yeah, You cannot run an agent on top of that. You cannot manipulate the operating system in many ways we do with a full-blown operating system. So DNS is one of the few parameters we can actually configure on the IoT devices. So it's not maybe the optimal way, uh, uh, um, maybe a, uh, something that runs on that client would give us more, but it is better than nothing. I see it uh, in, from that perspective then. Yeah. Well, does DNS always have to be configurable? Just throw on quad eight and be done. <laughs> Going back to the, the companies that say, well, we'll just make it easy for you. Do you want your production IoT thing that is running millions per day uh, using the Google for oh, free no. DNS? Yeah. No, definitely. I don't want to go into Google at all. But I'm just saying, as you know, as some IoT uh, manufacturers, they don't seem to think about security, and they might do something like that. Well, I, I think they do think about security, but they think about it in a way different than anybody else because they're they're looking at that three legged stool of you know fast, cheap, and good. Pick two, and they want fast and cheap, and that's their security mantra. One of the big things, though, you have to understand that there's a lot of different IoT solutions out there. There's so many different standards from Zigbee to Bluetooth, LoRaWAN, 5G is getting in this market, Wi-Fi, and security solutions. Some of those solutions just provide lower layers. Some of them are more of a complete protocol stack. And businesses and, and home users are deploying a variety of different technologies so there's not it's not like you can just point to iot and say here's how you fix it um the 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 market is just too fragmented when it comes to different devices yeah but uh, just in response to that if i'm an attacker i want to own a lot of iot devices i need to have a command and control channel to them i don't care what they speaking locally, if it is Zigbee or something else, I want somehow that the IoT devices are sent me back something to my command and control server, and I can manipulate them. And of course, their DNS is always a good choice for these attackers. If you ever had the problem with static IP addresses, also these guys need to maintain their backend uh, infrastructure. So I think it's a way of finding out at least these Backend communications. Of course, we cannot stop that the malware is maybe on the systems, but we can maybe detect that there is something ongoing. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, IoT devices come with their inherent flaws anyway, from hard coded IP addresses to hard coded default admin passwords, right? So, one of the only tools we have uh, in order to protect those devices is has been DNS um, and being able to understand what they're talking to and what they're communicating with. These are devices that rarely get patched, that have firmware components on embedded. Uh, silicon that rarely gets replaced or updated, devices that are in control over HVAC and other systems for longer than your typical life cycle of a piece of hardware, 10, 12, 15 years, and they're outdated in a lot of cases. And DNS is one of those communication protocols that allows us to really see what these devices are talking to and prevent them from becoming part of the latest botnet. The minute you start imposing 
requirements on these devices there is um and not that that's wrong but i'm just saying the minute you impose those things you ramp up the prices and the capabilities that need to be in those devices and therefore uh, some of the business opportunities dissipate so um it's unfortunate but we do have to have a, a way of also having devices that don't have that capabilities on our networks. And maybe we just have different techniques for managing that. I think it goes back to what somebody had said in the last discussion about standards. These devices need to have some standards. Um, and until that happens, you're gonna have the full gamut of configurable to completely unconfigurable or manageable devices. Um, being installed on your network without without your knowledge in some cases. And something I'd say about security in general, at some point you find the cost one place or another. The company Tom hinted at earlier, you know, probably spend a bit more after the compromise than it would have cost to prevent the compromise. Uh, easy to say that in hindsight, but in a lot of cases, maybe it's worth spending an extra 10% or 20% to avoid ending up on the cover of every single information technology magazine and national newspaper for two months. I will yeah. say that was actually, that was one of the things I used to tell people all the time was the job of a school superintendent is to not have news reporters show up. And if that means you have to pay a little bit more, trust me, you'd rather not make the news. Um, Alex, uh, you guys actually have a solution to some of these weird IoT DNS query issues, and you and I were talking about it in the prep session for this. Um, how do you solve some of these problems? Yeah, we are not solving all the problems for sure, and here we are talking about uh, only IP IoTs for sure, uh, not uh, not um, some other fancy protocols. Um, what we propose is not for IoT only, but it's a good use case because I guess for IoTs, um, in order to protect the, the corporate network, uh, one of the things we can do is uh, restrict the, the domains or the FQDN, the, the IoT can, uh, can resolve through the DNS. Um, not all the companies are using uh, NAC systems uh, able to, to do um, very advanced fingerprinting, this kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> and, and as um, it has been said, some IoT are deployed on the network. You, you don't even know uh, when you're working in the network, in the network team. So uh, what, what we propose uh, uh, on the, our uh, DNS security engine, which is called uh, Guardian, is, is to have this uh, ability to apply a specific filtering list on which you can put whatever domains uh, you want the IoT to be able to access, and you can apply that to a subset of your network. Uh, so it's it's a far more advanced way of doing views. Some of you may be familiar with DNS views, but it's very difficult to manage. Here we are managing that uh, in a very different ways. And uh, since uh, at um, Efficient IP we are not just doing DNS, we are doing DDI, and then we do manage the the, the total IP address plan through the IPAM and the DHCP service as well. We can we can leverage the uh, fingerprinting we do on DHCP and automatically put the um, the unknown device like that can be an IoT for example or or known signature from a DHCP perspective into a um, put put this device and its IP address into a specific client list and apply to this client list a specific filtering list. This is what we call client query filtering, and and therefore automatically you can you you can add um, an amount of um, security to your network without having a lot to manage, uh, because some companies are using a lot of IoT devices. Uh, we are not just talking about some few cameras or bulbs, uh, which is funny, but uh, some some companies are are dealing with uh, valves and. Uh, a lot of lamps and a lot of um, sensors. Um, so that's that's one of the way we we propose to uh, to enhance the DNS filtering service uh, for for these kind of devices. And and for sure, it can be applied to any other family of or groups of devices or users, uh, because we do that also for for users to to apply some security uh, uh, for specific users. I, I've, uh, th there's just one thing I haven't heard about the IoT is the, the ability for 
because the software is not always well protected effectively and maybe using all the protocols, uh, the ability for attackers to use these, um, these devices to perform a denial of, distributed denial of service. That's something very interesting, uh, I guess, uh, from the hacker perspective, because we have seen that a lot and, and uh, the amount of bandwidth consumed uh, to perform this kind of attack is, uh, is uh, increasing every year. Yeah, and the you know we we've talked a lot about enterprise security for IoT, but that's a good point. Is on the consumer side of things, there are millions of these devices out there that um, are vulnerable with unpatched versions of certain protocols. And we've seen you know the Mirai botnet a number of years ago it was a massive DDoS attack, um, you know in excess of it was over 600 gigabits per second that Akamai you know documented, um, you know and, and none of these solutions we've talked about without some standards for consumer devices, you know, fixes that problem. And this is why we are talking with, uh, with some ISP who wants to propose this kind of security models to their, uh, to their uh, consumer. Like we, we always talk about parental control, but we, we can have this uh, IOT protection uh, proposed to um, by some ISPs to their, to their customers by uh, being able at the DNS level uh, to filter out some um, some known uh, and malicious uh, activities from those div those kind of devices. That that's a service we can we can propose with our with a machine um, uh, because it's scalable. And this is why we developed it. It's to be scalable and to be able to to scale to millions of IoTs and millions of uh, domains. And then the the discussion circles back to trusting your ISP, right? Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Your ISP or your first uh, DNS resolver, because uh, as, as mentioned, you can use uh, specific uh, services who are uh, providing protection at the DNS level. 